cowboy style of life is just different from, you know, living in a big city and having a suit and tie and, and uh, you know, we're all about Jesus here, but we wear our cowboy hats and our boots. And we have a heart for the youth in college here in Weatherford. We do buckouts and bull rides and team ropings and calf ropings and anything to do with arena events. We have a ride every uh, third Monday night of every month. And uh, tonight we're going to just buck some bulls. We're going to have a little word. Uh, the rule is you need to be here by 7 o'clock and then we'd say Jesus paid your fees and, and you get to ride for free. It's just like heaven. If you don't accept Jesus, uh, before the gates close, then you don't get in, and it's the same thing. We're going to look at uh, Mark, the 10th chapter tonight. Then in the What's arena, the it's simply, uh, it's time to just get real. It was a good rush. Get on the next one. We spend time with the kids. We don't just uh, get here and disciple them and, t and preach at them. We work behind the buck and shoots with them. Other than that, uh, it's, it's church. Welcome to the broadcast. My name is Dr. David Simmons. This is Silverado Cowboy Church, where Jesus is king of the cowboys and everybody's welcome. What that means is God has no respect for persons. We're glad you're here. Listen to the word today because the word of God will change your life. The Bible tells us that it's in the inspired word of God. It was given for correction for instruction in righteousness and so we have to remember that it will change our life every time we hear it by the washing of the water of the word so listen to the word enjoy it and I'll talk to you at the end good morning everybody this is uh, the first week of course of the quarantine from uh, more than 10 people meeting according to what our uh, governor has said before it was a suggestion now it's a mandate and that's why we're doing what we're doing so today as we live stream uh, I'm going to encourage you to uh, grab your Bible uh, grab a cup of coffee uh, if you ha don't already have communion stuff together uh, grab a you know and, and, and if you don't have grape juice don't worry about it if you have coffee put a little bit of coffee in your uh, cup for communion um, if you don't have uh, the kind of uh, communion bread that we use. Um, you know, today, because I, I wanted to make sure that you understood it doesn't matter what it is, I, I've got a vanilla wafer that I broke. And so I want to encourage you, communion doesn't have to be a certain kind of bread, a certain kind of drink. It just has to be something that represents the body and the blood because that's what we're going to do. And we're going to take communion together a little later on. So we'll uh, talk about that. Let's go to the Lord right now. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity that you give us to live in a country where we have the freedoms that we have. Father, the ability to be able to live stream like we're doing right now. Uh, Father, and, and the ability to be on television, on the internet. And Father God, today as we open your word, I ask, Father, that everything that you uh, reveal to us by your word, that we'll receive it by your spirit, the same spirit that you wrote it. And Father, that it'll bring revelation to our life today. 
that we can grow and become the kind of people that you want us to be, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, walking in faith and living in faith. Father, we praise you. We give you glory and honor and power in the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning, uh, I want to ask you to uh, grab your Bibles. I'm going to read this morning out of the New King James. Um, and we're going to go to Isaiah uh, chapter 5 to start with. We're going to cover a lot of different things today. Uh, mostly, uh, I'm going to talk first about where we are as Christians and the kind of things we do. Um, the reason that we're in, a, and I'm going to real briefly cover this, uh, in Romans 12.3, it says to pray for those who are in leadership over you. Um, it also tells us that we should submit to our leadership and that's the reason we're doing what we're doing. Faith to me tells me I'm not worried about everything else that's going on. Uh, that uh, we're going to talk about to the coronavirus real briefly a little later on. Uh, one of the reasons we're going to take communion today. We actually were going to take communion live in church today but uh, uh, I decided uh, I think we should do it because of all the negative things we're hearing right now and some of you may even have a cough runny nose uh, may have had a little fever or something and I, I want to make sure you remember we've not been given the spirit of fear but we've been given the uh, spirit of love and of power and a sound mind so we have to remember we're not going to be moved by everything we hear. I'm not going to be moved by if symptoms try to come to my house. Um, we're, we're, we'll look at all of that a little later on. But what I want to talk to you about out of uh, Isaiah chapter 5 is uh, the first, about five verses is what we're going to read first. It says this, start, starting in verse 1. Uh, and, and the very top part, and, and I don't know if all Bibles do this, but the Spirit-Filled Life Bible I'm reading out of, the heading on it is God's Disappointing Vineyard. Um, we realize that Isaiah first was a prophet to Israel. It was about Israel. Uh, but one of the things we have to remember is nothing from the Old Testament passed away even though this prophecy is about Israel, as I, as I read it, you're going to see it actually, if we're not careful, could be about you and me and about the church. And, and that's why we're, we're going to look at this uh, today. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 1 says, Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved Regarding his vineyard. Um, and all of those, if you look, are capital uh, B and capital H and capital W of when it t says well, beloved. So we realize this is literally the Godhead talking to one another about uh, this vineyard. My well beloved, and the Godhead, and let me qualify that, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the Godhead. And I don't pretend to understand how you get three persons in one. I just know that that's what it is because the Bible tells us that. And if the Bible's true from the front to the back, we know that we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Son to earth to die for you and I that we could have life uh, that we could have it more abundantly, that we could have life after death with him, uh, that we could not live in condemnation but be set free by his blood. Uh, and then he sent the Holy Spirit after he went back so that we would have a comforter. So that's how the three function. The Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Holy Spirit, and that the Godhead uh, functions in heaven as well as on earth together. My well-beloved uh, has a vineyard and on a very fruitful hill. Verse 2, and he dug it up and he cleaned out its, its stones. 
and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, let's stop there just a minute before we go on and, and, and kind of reflect on, on what he's talking about here. Now, we know that he's talking about when Israel came into the land of Canaan. Um, the land of Canaan, and it was called the land of Canaan because the Canaanites were there, and those were the stones that he re removed. We go all the way back to Joshua, and you can look at uh, who Joshua defeated. It, it goes through the entire land of Canaan, and, and it says he defeated the king here, the king here, the king here. What Some of them would be uh, Megiddo. Um, uh, one of them was the king at what was known then as Panos. We know it as Caesarea Philippi uh, today. Um, he, he defeated all of these kings. Those were the stones that God removed. When he defeated those kings and he removed all of the sinful people, Jericho, you remember what happened to Jericho, how the walls fell at Jericho and everybody scattered and, and they were afraid of God's people. God did that. That's how he took the stones out and then he began to plant the vineyard. Okay. We in, in a farming community, um, ranching community, we know that you take the stones out so you can plow you take the, if you've got an arena like we do here at the church, uh, you take the stones out so a horse doesn't step on them, a bull doesn't step on it if, a, if you're bucking bulls, a kid doesn't fall on them if they fall off a, a sheep during the mutton busting. Um, there's a lot of things uh, stones are an enemy too. Um, one of the things that I'm realizing in this, as we become Christians, Sometimes, and that's what I want to get out of this uh, Isaiah, the fifth chapter. Sometimes we forget to remove the stones and we try to live a Christian life and we allow the stones to just continue to, uh, you know, and it's, we, we've talked about this many times, like the, in, in the arena. We picked up stones, picked up stones, picked up stones. We work it. We till it up, get ready for the next event, and there's more stones. It seems like stones multiply. And in our own lives, if we don't clean the stones out, if we don't get rid of the, the sinful part of our life when we become Christians and we continue to live like we've lived, then that's where this wild grapes comes in. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Uh, because it, it, as, as far as I can see, the Bible teaches one thing. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we'll be saved. For the, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, with the heart one believes unto righteousness. And that's exactly what it takes to be saved. Um, so... If I don't clean the stones out of my life and I continue to let those stones multiply, if I don't clean the sin out of my life, one of the things we have to remember, sin was cleansed away by the blood of Jesus when we accepted Jesus as our Savior. It wasn't covered up. It, wa it wasn't, but it was done away with. It was paid for, gone. But that doesn't mean that we don't choose to continue to live in that place that we were even though that really was done away with. We make choices in our life. God doesn't want puppets. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't make us do things. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. Jesus said that when uh, the Spirit of truth has come, that he will lead you where you should go. He'll remind you of things I've said. And he'll tell you of things to come. So 
I choose to listen to the Holy Spirit. I choose to do what the Holy Spirit leads me to do. I choose to believe what the Holy Spirit is telling me about things to come. Or I choose to live where I'm still living. Because God loves me so much, he'll protect my right to let the stones stay in my life instead of me getting ri just letting them go. Because I can grab them back, I can continue in that place. So what you have to understand is it was done, it was finished. You became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, but that doesn't mean you have to continue in that place. You're always going to be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You're always going to have a destination of living with God after this life is over. But what happens to you in between? And that's where this vineyard comes in. And, and as I look at this and I, I think about what, what, this, what, what the Father and the Son were talking about right here is, hey, I cleaned all the stones out. I took care of everything. I planted the choicest grapes. You are the choicest grapes of God in his vineyard when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. In this place, Israel was the choicest people on the face of the earth because God planted them in his chosen vineyard at that time. But what they did was they made choices to follow other gods to do things that they did. Did that make them not be God's vineyard? Absolutely not. They were still God's vineyard. Today, the Bible still calls Israel the apple of his eye. So what we know is from this time in Isaiah, God never changed his mind. You know what I think the cool thing about God is? Is he doesn't change his mind. He didn't make a mistake but he'll protect our right to continue to be where we're at as well as he'll could protect our right to come into the kingdom of God right here on this earth. Jesus said, I'm come that you might have a life or the God kind of life. The word was Zoe. The God kind of life and have it more abundantly. He'll protect your right to have the God kind of life right here. And he was talking about right here the reason that we know that is because I don't need the God kind of life after I leave this earth and I'm there with him because I'm going to be in his presence. I'm in the God kind of life then. But now I'm not. I'm, not, I'm, an, I'm in an unperfect world. I'm in a world that's full of stones. I'm a, in a world that has all kinds of things going on. And I have to remember who I am. I am the choicest vineyard of God. So I don't want to continue like it says here, but it brought forth wild grapes. So it goes on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard, that I, ha that I have not done what that I have not done in it. Why then? When I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Now let me plea now and now, please let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I'll take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. Now, there's a difference between that in the Old Testament and today. We can remove ourselves from the hedge of the protection of God by our choices and what we do. For instance, I'm going to talk real briefly this morning about the coronavirus. Um, I believe you heard enough about it. Um, we got a lot of bad information out there about it. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of good information. But what I know is, we're going to look at Psalm 91 in a minute for just, just a, a brief minute for a little bit of it. But what I know as we look at it, when it says no plague shall come near my dwelling, doesn't mean that I go out and hang out with people that got coronavirus. Because if I go hang out with them, then I'm tempting God saying, hey, you're going to protect me, so I'm just going to go do what I want to do. 
we, we already know we're not going to do that. We're not going to go to those kind of places. That's the reason that our governor in Texas has done what he's done. And, and uh, the governor of New York, the gov governor of California, uh, the governor of New Mexico, um, and, and I think pretty much all of the United States has m made the same choices. Um, and that's to uh, close restaurants, churches, gyms, um, every place that you would go that you would congregate with people because some people won't stay home uh, when they've got the coronavirus. Uh, but we will. We, we don't want to go to those places. We don't want to get them because I don't want it to. If I believe it's not going to come near my dwelling, why would I try to go bring it to my dwelling? And, and that's the thing to think about. Well, here's, here's exactly what Isaiah was talking about in this place. And when God said um, that he, would, uh, he was going to burn this vineyard, well, we know because of history and because of everything that Israel went through for uh, the many, many years uh, between this and, and uh, Jesus and then from... 70 years after Jesus' time on till 1948. We know that they'd been scattered all over the world. Um, somebody else had inhabited the land. Um, all those kind of things. But God is faithful and he is a forgiving God who wants to take care of those of the apple of his eye, of those that accept Jesus Christ. You know, the cool part about uh, Israel being the apple of God's eye is Galatians 3.29 says that when you're in Christ, your heirs according to the promise of Abraham, which is Israel, because that's Israel is Abraham's descendants. Well, as Christians, we're Abraham's descendants and we're subject to all the wonderful promises that God made to them. Um, and, and, you know, that's part of that's a side note, but a, a lot of it has to do with that makes me come into that place that I want to be good grapes. I don't want to be wild grapes. I want to, I want to be the kind of uh, Christian that God wants me to be. Um, sometimes uh, it gets uncomfortable, uh, especially now where everybody's kind of supposed to be locked up at home and things. Um, I personally don't know what else to do but spend time with, with our Father and listening. And I'm talking about our Heavenly Father. Um, and, and listening to what his spirit has to say to us. And, and uh, I can tell you personally that sometimes that becomes uncomfortable because he always points out the places that you can get better. Which doesn't mean you've disappointed him. It means that he wants you to be better. Well, in my eyes, in my life, that's disappointing to me because I don't ever want to disappoint my father in heaven. I want to be the, the kind of believer, the kind of uh, pastor, the kind of person, first of all, the kind of person that he wants me to be. And so as we look at that, and I believe that when we look at Isaiah here in these uh, five verses that we looked at, yeah, five verses we, we looked at, I was making sure we didn't just read four, um, and so that's chapter 5, the first five ver verses. And how I see the church today as a whole. I'm not talking about the few. Um, there's always going to be a few in every crowd. I'm not talking just about Silverado Cowboy Church. I'm not talking just about... Uh, the church down the street or the church across the block or the church in, in the other town, um, wherever it is that you could think of. Because I know that everybody that's watching isn't just watching from Silverado Cowboy Church. You, you, you're all over the country and I realize that. So, thinking about this, realizing that every church that is named over the whole United States has got some in it that are living as wild grapes and a lot 
that are living as good grapes, that are doing what God wants them to do, trying to keep the stones out of our life. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not one of those guys that walks around barefooted. I don't walk around barefooted on the carpet in the house because I'm, I'm going to find that one sticker in the whole house that got in to the carpet, and so I don't do it. I don't walk across uh, rocks in the parking lot uh, barefooted. It hurts. Stones in your life hurt your walk with God. They hurt you spiritually, they hurt you physically, and they hurt you more mentally. If you're spiritually healthy, you're going to be mentally healthy. If you're walking in religion, then you begin to live as wild grapes again because now I'm trying to measure up I'm walking in religion, not in a relationship with God. And that is what this really says to me, is the good grapes, the choicest grapes that God planted, you and I, when he planted us uh, where we are, doing what we're doing, whatever your walk of life is, God didn't just pluck you up and send you to Africa or someplace else. There are some of us that travel in and out of Africa. Uh, there are some of us that do, do that because God called us there, not because he made us go there. And he doesn't pluck you up from where you're at, but he lets you grow where you're at. And that's exactly what choices grapes do. They bear fruit, they come into that place that they're able to do that. So that kind of brings me to the place that I was going to go back into. Uh, uh, I want to go to Psalm 91. Um, we're going to look at uh, uh, Proverbs. Um, and then we're going to go into Hebrews for a minute. And, and, and the reason we're going to kind of uh, move around. I heard a guy say the other day. He says, you know, it seems like. Scripture contradicts itself. It, it says something one place, and it says it says something else another place. No, it doesn't say something else. It says it a little bit differently that enhances, because all Scripture, remember what 2 Timothy says, it says, uh, it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, if all scripture is given by inspiration of God, God doesn't think one thing one day and something else 2,000 years later. What we're going to find is it all agrees and it enhances one another and makes it come into another place. And still staying with the theme of uh, be, be God's garden, God, God's vineyard, um, and don't be the disappointing vineyard, you know, that fourth verse, what he said is, Jerusalem and Judah, I want you to think about this, and I want you to tell me what I've done wrong. I believe that what God says to you and I is, is there a problem? And whatever that problem is, did I cause it? Or what have I done wrong that you're not in that place? And so I want to move that into the area of faith and how faith, especially in these times that we're living in a, a challenge. Um, I, uh, I try not to get political and, and every once in a while I realize that it's hard to uh, not be a little political in, in when you quote somebody. Um, I, I'm not, I've never been, and of course I don't live in New York and so I don't have to. I've never been a great fan of uh, the governor of, of New York. Um, but I'm going to honor him and tell you he said something that was so biblical yesterday that it is, there's so much truth in it. He said this, he said this sickness, the coronavirus, is two-tier. He says, number one, there's the sickness, the virus that causes people to get sick. And number two, there's fear. And he said, the greatest problem with the sickness is not the virus, it's the fear. 
And I thought, wow, that was a great biblical statement. And he really wasn't even trying to make a biblical statement. But it's so true that when we allow fear, it becomes... And I went into Isaiah for one reason. Because fear can be the biggest stone in our vineyard. The biggest stone in our life can be fear that I can't overcome. And how can I overcome fear? It's feeding myself on the Word of God. Feeding myself on all Scripture that's given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. And that's the, that's the key. It's profitable to my mind to keep me in that place that I can be profitable to the people around me. Because if I'm discouraging to the people around me, I'm going to tell you, nobody wants to hang out with somebody that's discouraging. Um, I have a, a friend uh, that uh, called me this morning. I talk to him almost every day. And I'm going to tell you who it is. John Somerville calls me today and he says, I don't know when you changed the voicemail on your telephone, but boy, you sounded depressed. And... So I immediately, I didn't even listen to it. I immediately got on there and changed it because I'm not depressed. I don't want anybody to think I'm depressed. I don't want anybody to think I'm uh, scared, in fear, or falling down. I do. I am not going to go someplace and hold hands and, and uh, hug somebody that uh, has a coronavirus. Th that would be ignorance on my part. But I'm not afraid of the virus because it's not going to come near my dwelling. And that's what I want to look at for a minute right here in Psalm 91. i um, not going to spend a lot of time here. Uh, you can see a, a two-minute devotional I posted on uh, Facebook, uh, not only on the public page, but on Cowboy Church Ministries' uh, Facebook page uh, yesterday. And, and I went a little bit deeper into Psalm 91, but... Here's where Isaiah chapter 5 and Psalm 91 to tie together. He, and I'm starting in verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God and Him will I trust. And all of a sudden, that right there is good grapes. That is the choicest grapes because they depend on God. They listen to God. They do what He says. I'm going to tell you something about sheep. The Bible in many places calls us sheep. Um, first, uh, uh, Psalm 23, and if you watch uh, Wednesday night, I, I went into Psalm 23, but... Uh, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, to have a shepherd, you've got to be a sheep. I've shared with, on this broadcast as well as uh, with the church many times, uh, I learned two different things from owning sheep. The first time I owned sheep, somebody else took care of them. And when they moved, they brought them to the church. Guess who got to feed them? Um... And every day when I'd walk in there and they're swamped all over my legs and about to knock me down because I'm carrying their feed bucket and, and they just want the feed. I have no illusion that they, were, they weren't in love with me. They were in love with the feed bucket. Okay. And I said, Lord, what are you trying to teach me by me taking care of these sheep? Because I thought it was really cool when... Uh, Kelly, and I, I, I absolutely went blank on the last name. Crawford. Kelly Crawford took care of those sheep. And when her and Stephen moved to East Texas, I got the sheep back. It's really cool because I didn't have to learn anything. She took care of them. Um, the Lord told me this. He said, I want you to learn to be around my feet like those sheep are around yours. The way they rub all over you, I want you to rub all over me. I want you to listen to me. I want you to let me take care of you. I want you... Well, that's exactly what I was doing, was taking care of those sheep. I was feeding them every single day, making sure they had water. I was the one 
And I've never wanted to call myself a shepherd. But I was the one that they were looking to to take care of them. That's what this psalm is talking about. In these first two verses, um, in, in, the, in the heading right over it says, Safety in abiding in the presence of God. And so those sheep were able to know, number one, they were safe when I was there. They were fed when I was there. They were watered when I was there. And when I came back, I did it again. And had I not shown up, and Kathleen didn't take over and do it, then they wouldn't have eaten. So the next group of sheep that I owned, I went and I bought a, a bunch more sheep for, for the kids for mutton busting and, and things that we do in the arena. Not only do will these sheep not come to the bucket. When, it, when I walked in, I mean, they ran. Uh, the first Little Wranglers rodeo we had, uh, one of those sheep got out, and we caught him somewhere between two and three miles from here. Um, when we caught him, we had to catch him. We had to sucker him to a feed bucket to even get a hold of him and get him back. Excuse me, her. Um, so, here's the two, the two things. If we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we're going to be around His feet. We're going to be listening to Him. We've got to be so close. In this place, it, it says that under His uh, He shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He'll say that of, of Him... Uh, he is my refuge and my fortress. In my God I will trust. Hey, those sheep that, that was, were in the second group, they didn't trust anybody. They'd never been around a feed bucket. They'd been uh, in a pen where they fed them a, a roll of hay, and that's all they ever knew. So I said, Lord, what do you want me to learn now? Because this was really frustrating. I mean, here, I, I, I've got this picture of there's going to be no problems because when I feed them, they're coming. He said, I want you to learn to feed my sheep. I want you to learn how to have the sheep follow you to be around my legs and to rub all over me, just like I told, taught you before. Well, what that took was carrying a feed bucket into that pen every day. It actually not only got to be a chore, but because all of a sudden they're around your feet and they're not letting you go. In fact, if we turned them out somewhere, you just go out with a feed bucket and they'd follow you right back into the pen. Um... It got to be a chore because the ram got so bad, he'd see you, he'd just run at you and butt you. Where that ram before had run from you anywhere he could go. Now, I'm going to tell you that it's not a pleasure to get butted by a ram. Um, they hit pretty hard. Um, now all of a sudden i got to figure out how to get him to back off so somebody doesn't get hurt. Now, what I'm trying to get across to you in all of this is abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Do you know how close you got to be to somebody for their shadow to fall on you? For, for that shadow to cover you up? That is so close that you're almost walking against them. And that's what I see in these first verses. Now the, key, the it goes on and it says he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler. 
and from the perilous pestilence. He'll cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. He shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the, er the terror by night, or the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. Listen to verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes will you look and shall you see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. Choice grapes. If I make God my dwelling place, I no longer am going to put forth wild grapes. David wanted to do it this way. You know, I think one of the biggest songs that Elvis Presley uh, got at, at the end was, I did it my way. Um, I don't want to do it my way. What I found out, when I do it my way, not only is it the way that doesn't lead to always being protected by the shepherd, always being in his shadow, always being so close to him. Hey, I'm going to tell you what happens when you feed enough sheep. Whoever doesn't get to the feed bucket fast enough doesn't get any of that feed. If you're too far out or you're too slow getting to the feed bucket, the other ones already have it eat up. And that doesn't mean the shepherd's going to bring more feed. That means I should have been close enough to the shepherd that the shepherd could take care of me the way that he wants to take care of me. And that's where the good grapes, the, the wild grapes come in in Isaiah. And that's where the protection or the I'm abiding on the outside of the protection because I'm not in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm out in that place that I really have to live in fear because I realize I'm not close enough. And that's where fear goes away and faith begins to grow because now I'm close enough. The Father's, I want to feel His breath on me. I want to know that when... He whispers in that still small voice. Remember, all the way through the Bible we see that the Holy Spirit talked in a still small voice. If he whispers in that small voice, am I going to hear him? If you have a TiVo or a recorder uh, on your television, you know if you didn't hear something that was said, you can hit that reverse button. And play it again. Turn it louder so you can hear it. You don't have a reverse button with God. I want to hear what he has to say. I want to do what he has to say the first time. Because if he has to repeat it, it might be down the road somewhere. And I might have went through a whole bunch of stuff in the middle that I didn't need to go through. Because I should have heard him in the beginning. And I should have listened to what he had to say in the beginning. So, then it says, A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Oh, I already read that. So, going down to verse 9. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. And so, all of a sudden I look, here's the promise. What's the key? I've got to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I've got to be so close that verse um, verse 4 where it says he'll cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll take refuge. Hey, the best picture of that is a hen in a barnyard that the dog comes in and the chicks all run under the hen and she drops down on them right there. Covers them up. You've got to be close for that to happen. If you're that chick that's out there a little ways, then guess what? The dog got you. I don't know about you, but I don't want the enemy to get me. I don't want the stones in my life 
to keep me from being close enough to the Father that I don't walk in that kind of protection. So I come into that place that I realize. So flip over now to uh, Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Um, I know uh, if you watched last week or, or you were here last week, uh, Joe talked a little bit about this too. Um, some of the things we want to do is we want to realize... Um, Hey, one of the things that's, that's grown greater through this week is the fear that's being thrown about this coronavirus has not got smaller, but it's got greater because it looks like, wow, it's overtaken things. I actually know somebody right now that has the coronavirus. Um, him and his wife both. He told me yesterday um, what he said to me, and they live in Oregon. Um, it, it's my own uh, biological brother. Um, he told me yesterday, he says, man, it's no different than when I've had a common cold before. He says, the only difference is I'm not going around anybody. I'm staying in my house. I'm not going anywhere because I'm quarantining myself away from everybody else. And so one of the things we have to realize is don't let fear overtake you. I'm going to tell you that plague can't come near my dwelling. Um, I'm not going to visit my brother right now uh, so that I can tempt God and see, if, see how this protection works works and how it, it covers me up. Um, I guess I flipped. I was in Hebrews and I flipped way too far too fast. Um, you know, I want to stop at, at chapter 4 for a minute. Chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. It is the discerner and the thoughts of the intents of the heart. So this word's powerful. When we, we look at all the word we've looked at today, okay, one, if I choose not to be a wild grape but I keep the stones out of my life because they were removed when I accepted Jesus if I keep the stones out of my life I let the Holy Spirit fertilize me make those grapes plump where I really have good fruit if I abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I do all of that, then I realize what this Word has done. It's become powerful in my life. It's not the Word that's powerful on black ink on white paper, but the Word that's powerful lives inside of us, and the Holy Spirit illuminates it uh, to us. So now we're going to uh, skip over to... Uh, Chapter 6, and verse 11. Now this is the writer of Hebrews, and it's presumed from the style that it was Paul, but I really don't care who it was. It was given by inspiration of God, uh, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof. Verse six, uh, chapter 6, verse 11, and it says, We desire that each one of you show the same diligence and the full assurance of the hope to the end that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who by faith and patience inherit the promises. So, one of the things that I want to do, if I want to abide in the shadow of the Almighty and bear good fruit, abide in the shadow of the Almighty and have protection that no plague will come near my dwelling. So we're looking at everything that's tied with this. I don't want to 
take it for granted. I don't want to become sluggish. But I want to imitate those who by faith obtain the promises. I have a friend, a uh, very good friend, that many years ago, um, and this was probably somewhere around 25 years ago that this happened. He had, he had believed God for a, a white Cadillac with red interior. I don't know why he wanted it. Never ask him. But he kept saying, the Lord, because the Lord had shown him that he was going to give it to him. He says, I, I got a white Cadillac with red interior coming. Yeah, and, and real honestly, a lot of times we thought, I don't know if that's faith or if he's just dreaming. And one day, he drove the white Cadillac in with red interior that a guy had handed him the keys and said, hey, Lord told me to give you this. And so, that guy, and the reason I shared that is because that guy was somebody who I could look at and say, I can imitate those who by faith obtained the promises because God had told him he was going to get this white Cadillac. Did he need it? I'm not his judge. I don't know. I know that it mightily blessed him and his faith because God brought what he said he would bring to him in there. He, he by faith obtained the promises. Good man to imitate who, which doesn't mean confess something just until it happens. But when God speaks something to you, don't let it go. I don't know who that was for. I believe somebody watching, God has spoke something to you and you kind of put it on the back burner. Pick it up and go again. One time, uh, the Lord had told Kathleen and I we were going to have a gospel tent. Well, I even went up and I looked at the tent to find out exactly how much it was going to cost. I'm going to tell you everything that I picked out was it was a little heavier, um, had all the things so that I it, it would last. It was ten thousand dollars to the penny. We had exactly zero dollars towards that tent. And you know, I'd kind of almost given up because I felt like the Lord told me this about, f about, about four years uh, before, it might have been four and a half, before this time. And so I'd kind of put it on the back burner and kind of given up. And, and not that I'd ever let it go, I just wasn't thinking about it anymore. And one day... And, and I remember whose driveway I was in. I was in, I was in a guy named Scott, Ch Scott and Fonda Chapman. I was in their driveway. I'd had coffee with them. I was going to do a Bible study. At that time, they lived in another state. And I was going to do a Bible study about 40 miles away from where they were at that night. And the Lord told me, he says, go tell Scott, get ready, the tent's coming. And the reason was because who Scott and Fonda Chapman were and are is he used to tell me I'm the elephant I'm the one that's going to put the tent up you just preach so the Lord told me he says go back in the house and tell him I was about to drive out the driveway go back in the house tell Scott get ready the tent's coming and uh, remember I told you imitate those who by faith obtain the promises and what came to my mind was that white Cadillac with red interior that the Lord had told him was coming and eventually it did. And I don't even remember how long it, it was. I think it was around three years that he had been telling us this. So I got out of the car. I went back in the house. He goes, what'd you forget? I said, the Lord told me to come tell you, get ready, the tent's coming. That night I did the Bible study. Well, a guy in a Bible study that night he handed me an envelope and he said, this isn't for the regular offering, this is for the tent. And nobody at that Bible study knew that I'd been believing for a tent. So God had spoke to this man 
that there was going to be a tent. Well, you know, I stuck that envelope in my pocket and I did the Bible study. Um, I, I mean, I was actually about 45 minutes down the road after this was all over uh, on the way back to the airport to fly out when I remembered the envelope in my pocket and I opened it and I had to pull over and cry right then because God had brought $10,000 to the penny for that tent. Now I'm sharing some of these things with you because God spoke some things to some of you whether it was jobs, whether it was and I'm not going to put something in your mouth something God spoke to you, don't let go of it hang on to it, talk about it the only reason I believe that it was about four and a half years for that check to come is I quit talking about that tent and the day I started talking about it again, there comes the money for it. And uh, we, we now, in fact, Silver Auto Cowboy Church, um, for about four years, met in that tent right here on this property till we had this building uh, built and, and, and got to inhabit it. So let's go to the 11th chapter of, of uh, Hebrews. And I actually don't know about where we are on time. Um, I think we're still pretty good. Okay. Um, I was looking to see how much time we had. So let's finish this and we're going to have communion. Chapter 11 verse 1 of Hebrews says, Now faith. Now faith. You need faith today for a lot of different things, whether it's finances, whether it's health. Right now, we need faith that that coronavirus can't come nigh our dwelling, period. Is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things, uh, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not, uh, things not seen. So let's stop there. We're going to finish just this verse and then we're going to have communion. There's three elements to faith. You have to see it. You have to believe it. And then you obtain it. And those three elements as you look at it. So I hope for it. When you look at the definition of this hope, it's not like we in the English language, we say, well, you know, I, I hope that happens. Which means, I'm not really sure it's going to, but, you know, it would be really nice if it did. That's not what this word says. This word says it calls things that don't exist as though they already do. That sounds like faith to me. I speak things into existence because I believe they're true. So, faith is seeing it. I got to see it with my eyes. I got to know it's coming. We were living in a 1946, uh, uh, excuse me, a 1964 4106 Greyhound bus. Ben broke down, we lost the motor, we lost the transmission, we lost the clutch after that. And the day that I had the clutch and the transmission all put back in, Lord told me, he said, don't leave that town with that bus. Well, I'd kept traveling and, and uh, Kathleen and, and our youngest son Curtis were staying there and, and actually where they were at is Apache Junction, uh, Arizona. Um, the Lord sent her to Tucson to look at another bus. She walked into 11 buses. She walked into one and the Lord said to her, this is your bus. And we didn't have enough money for the down payment. We had a thousand dollars. And uh, they... Uh, she told the person, said, uh, the salesperson, uh, this bus right here, I want to give you $1,000 down 
uh, to hold it. He goes, well, that's not enough for a down payment, but it will hold it. Um, through uh, a chain of events, we, we got that bus. In the natural, we shouldn't have had the bus. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. In other words, we saw that bus. When she walked into that bus, she saw that was her bus. Holy Spirit told her. It came to pass because she believed it was her bus. And the next thing that happened, it came to us. See it, believe it, and it happens. And that's what this verse means. Now faith. What are you believing for? How are you believing for it? Um, you know, we uh, actually uh, financed that bus for uh, 20 years. Um, that's how they finance those kind of buses. Um, in 12 years, they gave us the uh, title to the bus. By the way, we don't own it anymore. We built a house and, and we... we uh, um, I sold the bus so that I wouldn't be tempted to move back into it. Uh, but what a gift from God. But had Kathleen not believed that was her bus. I mean, the guy tried to pat her on the head and just let her go. You know, it's real nice, but you're not going to be able to, to afford this. The, well, the day that I signed the papers and I was sitting there, the guy that uh, was with me, that was instrumental in making sure that we got all of this put together. He looked at me and he said, you know, you could live in a nice one. This was what was called an American dream. It was a very expensive bus. Um, I, didn't, I paid less than half of what it actually cost uh, new. Um, and the guy looked at him and he said, man, that's the American dream. He says, yeah, but he could live in a Prevo if he wants to. Well, this guy was a jokester, but what he was saying was, I was a child of God. I could make my choice in what it was that I was willing to believe God for. What are you willing to believe God for? How are you willing to believe him? Whatever it is, if if you've had an attack of, of health, believe God's word says that it's uh, his will is for you to be in health. Um, if, if it's finances, believe that he says, I have pleasure in the prosperity of my people. Um, each and everything. Which brings me to the, the, the thing that... Uh, um, we didn't uh, pray over the tithes and offerings yet. Um, even though we're live streaming this, uh, I want you to know that if you're in town here and you want to drop your tithes and offerings back by, remember God blesses you for your tithes and offerings. Um, it's not that we, we're going to be scared the coronavirus is going to overtake us and we're not going to get paid. I believe every one of you is getting a paycheck. And if you're not, you're about to get one for President Trump. Because uh, I heard uh, yesterday that they turned 50 billion more dollars loose so that people could have their paycheck as they're going. Um, the other thing is you can click the button right there on Silver Auto Cowboy Church that says tithes and offerings on that page and give right there on the internet. So I'm going to pray over your tithes and offerings and then we're going to take communion. Father, I pray right now that each and every person that gives, that you give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, according to your word, to make room for more. Father, I thank you that you give to us that way, that you love us and watch over us, that you have pleasure in the prosperity of your people. So I pray over those tithes and offerings. In the name of Jesus, amen. I think it's important right now, and, and I hope that you've collected up the elements for, uh, for communion. Um, and, and I'm going to tell you, 
I, I didn't find any grape juice, so I'm right with you if you're not using grape juice. Um, I actually put a little bit of coffee in my cup, so that's uh, why it may look like it's grape juice because it's got a little bit of color to it. It's not important what you're using. It's important that as we take this, uh, whatever it is, your cracker, your cookie, whatever it is that you choose today that represents the body. Communion means fellowship. means to have fellowship with what he's done for us. And that's exactly what communion means. When I sent out the email a, a couple of days ago, maybe it was yesterday I sent it out. No, I, I, it was uh, actually Thursday I sent it out when the governor spoke. Um, I said we were going to have communion. Because in this time that there's a lot of sickness going around, some of it coronavirus and some of it has nothing to do with that. Um, there's a lot of people that are afraid of this. Don't live in fear. Receive the body. It says, by, by his stripes we were healed. That's what Peter said. Isaiah says, by his stripes we are healed. And Peter gives it past tense because Isaiah was, was prophesying about it and Peter was walking in faith. By his stripes we were healed. So f then when we take the blood, remember, hey, if you got stones in your life, today's the day to say, you know what? I'm drawing a line. The stones are done. I'm done with that part of that life. I'm going to move on and get in a different place. So right now, Father, I thank you for your son who died for our sins, whose body is represented in this in my case, in this cookie, Father, and, and whoever else, whatever they've got, bread, uh, ca cracker, whatever it is, Father, that it represents that body. I pray over that right now, that healing will come in their body if they need healing, that mental stableness will come if they need that. Father, I speak to fear, I tell you, in the name of Jesus, you have to leave as we take this body. Let's eat it together. Then, Father, I thank you for the blood that was shed for remission of sins, that all the stones in our life can go away, that all the sinful things that we think about or have maybe have done, that right now we're drawing a line in the sand and saying, this is for remission of sins, which means full payment as if it never happened. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you. For this blood. Let's drink it together. Hallelujah. You know I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, at this time I'm going to tell you that. Uh, it'll be uh, April 5th. Before we're back here. In the church live on Sunday morning. Unless they lift it sooner. Um, I did say in the email or they extend it um, I believe that uh, it's going to be lifted sooner and, and we're actually going to get to be back together before that but at any rate we'll be there then I will live stream on uh, Wednesday night remember Jesus loves you and so do we and Jesus is Lord I hope you've listened to the word uh, during this service so that you can have your life changed. You're, you'll see how the DNA of your entire life is about to change. Also, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've never made him the Lord of your life. Paul says this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made 
unto salvation. So it's very simple to do that. All I have to really do is say, Jesus is the Lord of my life and I believe that God raised him from the dead. That's exactly what Paul said. Many times we have people pray a prayer uh, so that we know that we've drawn a line in the sand and we've let everybody know that we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior. So I want to do that with you right now so that you can literally say, today is the day and whatever time it is, wherever you're at watching, you'll know that you've had a change in your life. So say this with me. You can bow your head and close your eyes or you can keep your eyes open. Uh, and uh, I, I always love what uh, Oop Schroner, who is a prophet of God, said. He said, if you're drowning in a swimming pool at the Holiday Inn, you wouldn't want anybody to close their eyes. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're literally drowning in a swimming pool of sin someplace. So say this with me. Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for me. I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me of them. And Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. And I commit today that I will live for you the rest of my life. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, if you just did that, then what you just did is you invited Jesus Christ to live in your life, to be the Lord of your life, and you're going to see a complete change in every area of your entire life right now. If you've watched this broadcast, you also know that uh, what we've talked about at different times uh, through different broadcasts is, is finances. If we, the Bible tells us in Luke 6.38 that if we give, that he'll give back to us, press down, shaken together and running over to make room for more. Then it says, uh, right after that, and this is Luke 6, 38. Then it says, whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used to measure what is given back to you. So if you become a covenant partner with us today, there's many things that we do for outreaches here out of this church and out of the ministry. Not only here in Weatherford, Texas, but all over the country and all over the world. We uh, have rodeo events right here in the arena where we have, uh, he paid your fees. Simply means that nobody pays to, to enter. They come, we have a devotional, it becomes an outreach opportunity. And we do that in rodeo arenas, horse show arenas, and roping arenas all over the United States. We drill wells and have uh, crusades in Nigeria, Cameroon, Togo, Uganda, and Tanzania. And by doing each one of those, uh, you become, and becoming a covenant partner with this ministry, you become a part of those outreaches. You take part in the reward in the end time, as well as you get back pressed down, shaken together, and running over to make room for more because you're a covenant partner, and this is good ground. Bible tells us in another place he gives back. Uh, this is in uh, Mark, the 10th chapter. It tells us that he gives back to us some 30, some 60, and some 100-fold. Well, this ground has been worked. It has is, is been fertilized, and, and I would expect a 100-fold return on that. So there's a uh, website that you've seen. Do two things. One, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, let us know at that website address, and we'll send you some information so that you'll be able to walk that walk and succeed in life in your new Christian life. Also, if you give, there's a donate button right there. If you press that donate button and give, that seed gets planted into good ground, and it comes back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Kathleen and I pray every day over every partner of this ministry. So I want to make sure that we're able to pray for you and, and let us know the things that you may have need of in life so that we can bring them before the Father. Have a great day. Remember, Jesus loves you. We love you, and Jesus is Lord.